Well, it's been a while. It's been a few days, actually. I um, kind of slacked off a little bit. I was trying to wait to see if uh, anybody would like to uh, sort of watch the videos. So far, I think I've had five, maybe six hits. I was a little disappointed, I guess. So I was giving it some time. In any case, it's been enough time, regardless of the lack of number of getting you guys to see this or, or watching this, for part two of the end game course. Um, again, I want to remind you, watch this in HD so you can see the fine print on the right side of your screen. Um, we just finished the end game course king and pawn and now we're up to bishops of same color after that will be bishops versus knight and bishops for uh, bishop and knight versus rook and then bishops of opposite color and then we get into rook and pawn and this particular part of this will be over again I, I i didn't go through this i don't know if you guys can see this this uh little tiny red check marks here i did not actually look through this so if he's asking any questions that i need to answer um it's going to be new to me so without anything going on further i'm going to go ahead and start this this next position was reached in washington dc in 1996 against the master named bankston i had the white pieces we're going to focus on the bishop endgame here, but first we'll take a look at the transition into it. In this position, you can feel that white is a little better. I have an active rook compared to his. My king is potentially much closer to the game than his. His king is blocked by f7 pawn and f6 knight. My king has a clear path into the game. His queenside pawns look a little bit weak. Maybe my knight will be able to undermine them later. They're on the same color as my bishop. What would you play here? My first move in this endgame was a very important structural decision, and we'll be looking at a number of such decisions as this endgame course goes on. I played the move a4, immediately establishing a certain relationship between my bishop and his. My bishop became a good bishop, and his bishop became a bad bishop. Now this isn't only because of the move a4, but we see that now his b6 pawn is locked onto that square. He can't play b5. And his c5 pawn can't really move because then the b6 pawn will become very weak. The bishop will be opened up onto it. If you were to compare this structure here, where his pawns are on b6 and c5 and my pawn is on a4, with the structure, if he were to play the moves b5 and c4, huge difference. Here his queenside pawns are active, all on light squares, they're not targets. Here, his pawns are restrained on dark squares, they're targets. Such little decisions as this, like a4, can turn a whole endgame around. I spent a week in Switzerland a few years ago studying the endgame with Victor Korchnoi. It was considered to be one of the greatest endgame minds in the history of chess. It was an amazing time studying with him. It just blew my mind. But one of the most impressive elements of his endgame understanding was his ability to move the pawns. He understood structure and pawns better than anything I'd ever seen. This is a rather simple idea, but it's effective. A4. Now, if you were to think if we go back a moment, if it were black to move, what would he do? And you would see very quickly, the correct decision for black would be to play b5. Now the parallel on the king side would be for him to play h5 and restrain my pawns on this side. This is not quite as important because the kings are here, so the weaknesses can't really be exploited. That's why if the kings are on the king side, the queen side pawns tend to be more important in terms of their weaknesses. Anyway, I played a4, and he played rook d6, which is a good decision. He should trade off the rooks because my rook is more active. I saw that I had a better game. I played rook takes d6, bishop takes d6. Now what would you do? Remember, in the end game, we should have an active king, king f3. It's not so easy for black to bring his king to the game, because if his knight moves away to try to open up the f6 square, say he were to play knight d7, then my king would have a clear path in, king e4, threatening king d5 and king c6. If I play king e4, if he were to play king f6, I could play king d5, followed by king c6 after he moves his bishop. I'm completely winning because of my active king. This is the way to play the endgame. Go for it with your king. After I would play king e4, he'd have to realize his mistake and play knight f6 check. And I would go back to d3, I'd have centralized my king and gain some time. So knight d7 would be a mistake. He has to try to bring his king in another way. King f8. 
Now I offered the trade of knights. Knight e4. If he takes it, knight takes e4, king takes e4. Then after king e7, I play king d5. And my king can never be chased off that square. It has a very powerful central position. My position is completely dominant now just because of, of my king. Very strong on d5. I'm threatening king c6. He'd have to play king d7. And then I could undermine his queen side with a move like a5. But we'll take a look at that in a moment. After I played knight e4, he played king e7. And here I made an interesting decision. I played the move a5. This looks like a pawn sacrifice, but really it isn't. I win it back very quickly. If he were to play b takes a5, then I could just play knight takes c5. Now I have a passed c pawn, and his two a pawns are controlled by my b pawn, so it would be like I'm up a pawn. Very good position for white. If he plays b5, that's even worse. I just play knight takes c5, and I really want a pawn. Now his a6 pawn is a weakness. After a5, he played knight takes e4, king takes e4, b takes a5. And this is the position that I really want to focus on. What should I do? I'm sure you're all over this one. King d5. Jump right in there. So now you see, of course, that it was just a temporary sacrifice. My next move is going to be bishop takes c5. He can't defend that pawn. But he also has to prevent my king from coming further in with king c6. He played king d7, and now our understanding of king and pawn in games comes in handy. I play bishop takes c5, very happily willing to trade into the king and pawn in game, because it's not so hard to evaluate this position as winning. If he were to play bishop takes c5, king takes c5, king c7, because of course I was threatening king b6, the win is pretty straightforward. I can play king d5, he would have to make moves, he can either move his king or his kingside pawns. If he moves too many pawns on the king's side, then I can come over there and attack him. I can always, of course, play king e5 to f6 and give up something on the queen side to try to attack his king's side. That's one way to win. But also, I could just move my pawn up c4, c5, c6. Nothing he can do to stop it. Then I can play king c5. Then he goes king c8. After he runs out of moves, of course, on the king's side, say he were to play f6 and then g5, and we were to make that trade, and I were to play g4. Then he were to play h6. Doesn't matter. He can't do anything on the king's side, and he'll run out of pawn moves. And I'll just be moving back and forth here. Finally, he'll allow me up. I'll take his two pawns here. I'll win the game pretty easily. It's very important to be comfortable in king and pawn in games so we're willing to simplify into them. Bishop takes c5 was a very easy decision for me. I knew that if he traded off bishops, I'd win without any problem. He has to avoid that trade. He played bishop c7. So now we've reached a position where we have even material, but white is completely dominant. My king on d5 cannot be moved out. He doesn't have a light squared bishop or anything that can attack it. My bishop on c5 is very actively placed. I have a passed c pawn, and my b pawn holds both of his a pawns. Those doubled pawns don't really pose any threat. If he weakens himself by trying to expand in the king's side, then my king will be able to slip over there and pick off those pawns. The only question remains, how do I win? In these types of positions, details are very important. My first move is essential. Remember the first move of this example, when I played a4, holding back his pawns. What would you do now? My first decision was b3. A quiet, but very important move. I lock his pawn onto the a5 square. This does two things. First of all, it limits the mobility of his bishop. And also, if he were to play a4, he would have more room. He'd have restrained my queenside pawn a little bit. His bishop could come out to a5. He'd be able to pretend a little activity. But most importantly, my b2 pawn would have become a weakness. He'd have something to hone in on. He could try to maneuver his bishop around and attack the b2 pawn and create a pass pawn of his own. b3 stifles all of his plans of aggression. There's nothing he can do but defend. After b3, he played h5, a good structural decision of the similar nature to the ones we've been discussing. He locks my pawns on dark squares. So I can't play g4 now, because the f4 pawn is weak. My pawns are here, he can think about attacking them. We have to think about what our opponent's plan is. White to move. What would you do? In all of my annotated games in Chess Master, I tell you, think about your opponent's plan. What does he want to do? Well, my opponent wanted to play the move h4, undermine my pawn structure, which is very similar, of course, to what I did to him on the queen side when I played a5. After h4, if I were to play g takes h4, then bishop takes f4, and interestingly enough, we would have exactly parallel pawn structures. My h3 and h4 pawns are exactly like his a6 and a5 pawns. And the b3 and c2 pawns are exactly like his f7, g6 pawns. I don't want that to happen. 
So now that you see what his intention is, what would you do? One response would be to play h4. That's not ideal, because now all of your pawns are locked onto dark squares. g3 is a potential weakness, then everything could fall. That's one way to play, but it's not necessary yet. If he plays h4, after I take it, my f4 pawn will be weak. I want to push my c pawn, but what's in the way? My bishop. How do we deal with both of those problems at once? I just play bishop back to e3, defending the f4 pawn, preparing to push my c pawn. A good prophylactic move. He played bishop d6. So now I chased him back, bishop d2. Still holding the f4 square, and attacking a5. I'm going to force his bishop back into passivity. He defended with bishop c7. Now I began to push my pawn, c4. My king on d5 can never be dislodged, so all I have to do is watch his aggressive ideas like h4. There aren't many of them, but he'll always be resourceful. And push my pawn up the board, and gradually stifle him. He played bishop d8. Now what? Here is the moment for us to activate our bishop. He's no longer threatening h4 because the f4 pawn is under attack. What do you do? Bishop c3. Now he played bishop c7 again, and here I decided to stop h4 from a more active position. Bishop f6. So we see by small moves, first b3, then bishop back to e3, back to d2, then I played c4, then I brought my bishop back to f6. I'm slowly strangling him. Black's position is having the air cut off from it. Another option would have been bishop e5, which is fine. It also stops h4. But then he could go back to d8. Of course, white is still winning. But I had another plan. After bishop f6, he played bishop b6. And I played c5. Bishop back to c7. Now this is a tremendously important position. I want you to take a few moments now. Don't move. Think for white. What would you like to do? The theme of my play so far in this endgame has obviously been to strangle him. I'm cutting off all the air, stopping black from having anything he can do at all. My c5 pawn now stops bishop b6. We know that the king and pawn endgame is winning. He can't play bishop d8, because I'll just trade and bring my king into c6. It's handy to be proficient in king and pawn endgames, no? He can't play h4, because I cover that square. His bishop has no squares, only b8. His king can't move anywhere, because if his king moves, then I'll go back to the c6 square. But if his bishop moves back to b8, what do you do? Now I can play the move bishop e5, offer a trade. We already know that all the trades are winning for me. So we'd have to go to a7, but then I could play bishop d6. And suddenly his bishop has been chased into a corner and there's absolutely nowhere to go. If he moves his king, I get to the c6 square and win. So we would have to try to move the pawns on the king's side, but he runs out of moves. If he plays, for instance, f5, then I just play h4. No more moves. If he plays f6, I can just play h4. And then after f5, I can move bishop e5. I'm not the one who has no options. If he moves his king, I come into c6, followed by bishop d6 check and king b7. He can't move his bishop. I'm winning. So what we just established is that in this position, if it were black's move, I would be winning. The king can't move. The bishop going back forces his bishop to the corner. He can't really do anything. So now the question is, how can white force it to be black's move in this position? White wants to lose the move. With that understood, take a few moments and figure it out. White to move, what do you do? Here I used a very, very important tool in converting this type of endgame. Because bishop endgames often come down to tempo, to changing the move over to your opponent, to Zugzwang. I played the move bishop g5. Does that change anything? Again, he can't play bishop d8, because we trade. If the king moves, I get to c6. He has to go to b8. Now what? Now I played the move bishop to h4. So now if he goes to a7, then I go to f6, he goes to b8, and I go to bishop e5. He has to go back to a7, and I win easily. His only move is to return to c7, but now we get just what we wanted, bishop f6. It's black to move in the position we want it to be black to move. This is called triangulation. The key was that I had two squares from which I could move to the square I needed to go. He only had one. 
Both g5 and h4 were open to me, and only b8 was open to him. So again, the solution is bishop g5, he's got to go back. Bishop h4, he's got to return. And I finish the triangulation, bishop f6. I've given the move to my opponent. This is a crucial idea. Make sure you understand it. Triangulation is a very important weapon in the endgame. So my opponent ran away with bishop b8. He could have tried the move a4. Maybe this would have even been his best chance. But then I would just take it. He'd have the a5 square open. He could try to continue to defend here, but of course I'm easily winning. I have the pass c-pawn. But you should note on the defensive end that sometimes in the endgame you have to make small material concessions in order to give yourself a little bit of room to breathe. He should have played a4. And after I take it, bishop a5. Yes, he's completely lost, but here he can try to breathe a little bit. Sometimes you have to give a little bit in order not to lose a lot. He played bishop b8, I played bishop e5, and he of course avoided the trade, he played bishop a7. If you were to play bishop takes e5, obviously after f takes e5, the position is easily winning. He can't do anything on the king side, my next few moves can be c6 check, king c7, king c5, he'll run out of moves, have to move his king, and I just play king d6. The way this position would end up being, would he'd probably have g5 and h4 and say we'd have made this trade. And I could play c7, king c8, and I have two ways to win this. The first one is I could play king e7 and immediately take the f7 pawn and then queen the e pawn. Or I could almost stalemate him, but not quite, because he has the move a4. Then I take it, he has to play a5, and then I move. And here he can either move his king to b7, allowing king d7, or make his final pawn move f6, after which I would simply take the queen. So I can almost stalemate him, allow him to throw away all of his pawns, collect them, and then just win easily that way. So obviously he can't trade bishops. So after bishop e5, he correctly avoided the trade, played bishop a7. Here I just played bishop d6. His bishop is locked into the corner. Now all that remains are some pawn moves and a king move. The king move will be desperate because I'll have the c6 square. So he played f5, I played h4, stopping all kingside play, and he resigned. Of course, you see that after he makes a move like king d8, I can just come in, and I'm easily winning. King e6, and then take his kingside pawn. There's nothing he can do, his bishop can't escape. And so this game was won by having a superior position of my king, of my bishop, having better pawns, and then I gave him a move. I used a device called Zugzwang. I triangulated, lost a move, <coughs> and forced him to make a move which destroyed his own position. This is a very, very important theme in Bishop Endgames. Keep it in mind. Okay. <clears throat> well, so far, I didn't have to answer any questions. And uh, how many minutes are we up to? I haven't been counting. Hmm. I think I'm going to pause this and find out. Okay, we're up to about 18 minutes. So that one's a little bit long, but uh, we're gonna we're gonna go ahead with the second part. Waitkin versus Shore Humor. Shore Humor. How do you pronounce that name? I don't know. This this next end game is a real fight. It was played in 1993 in Calicut, India, in the World Junior Championship. This was an incredible tournament, a real experience playing there, taking rig shots to every game. I had an amazing time. My opponent was a really talented young Indian player named Suresh Kumar, and it had been a tremendously hectic middle game. I attacked him, he got the queens off, we reached this end game, and I really wanted to win this game, it was an important one. So you're going to see a very, very tense struggle now. So we have to deal with the problems as they come up. Pretend you're involved in this game, pretend you're in it yourself. He began with g5, attacking my bishop. I played bishop b8. So now I'm attacking his pawn structure. You'll notice, of course, that the b6 pawn is restrained by my a4 pawn. You'll also notice he has a passed e pawn. I have potentially a passed h pawn, which could be good. I have a queenside majority, which is to my advantage, because there are, it's away from his king. He has a kingside majority, which is away from my king. My king is a little closer to his e pawn than his king is to my c pawn. These are small differences. The position probably is roughly even. Here he made a mistake. He played the move a5. From the last example, you probably can tell that a6 was the correct move. Don't lock your pawns on the same square as your opponent's bishop. a6 has the potential of b5. 
The reason he didn't do this, I think, was because he didn't want to allow me to expand further with b4 and b5. But a5 was a mistake. So now what do you do? Activate the king. King d2. Here my opponent missed his chance to completely activate his own king. Ideally, he should stop my king from entering on the queen side by bringing his king to c6. King e7 to d7 to c6 could stop king d3 to c4 to b5. But he began his kingside play, f5. I played again with the king. You'll often see this between players who are at slightly different levels of endgame understanding. One guy understands how to use the king, while the other guy just tries to push his pawns very quickly. A central king is key. And now he played king f7. He realized he had to bring the king into the game. I began to expand on the queen side. I played c3. We can feel how double-edged this fight is. I'm trying to play b4, take it, make a c-pawn passed. I'm trying to push in the queen side. He's trying to push in the king side. He played bishop e7. Now, I could have stopped his idea of king f6 by playing bishop e5, but it was unnecessary. Because if he tries to play king f6, then I can play king d4, and there's no way for him to stop bishop e5 check. There was no reason for me to prevent his move. So now he wants to activate his bishop by playing bishop c5. And I played a very strong central move, bishop e5. Notice, of course, that his last move stopped me from playing b2 to b4. I played bishop e5, partially covering the f6 square, keeping his king passive, but also preparing bishop d4 to attack his weakness and push his bishop back to passivity again. After bishop e5, he played king g6. He has the right idea, play with an active king. But notice about the central king. My king is in the middle of the board, and his king has been relegated to the side. A huge theme to my play was keeping his king under wraps, keeping it locked down. I played bishop d4, attacking the b6 pawn. He has to defend it, bishop d8. All of my moves are partially aimed at attacking weaknesses, partially aimed at expanding on the queen side, but also aimed at keeping his pieces passive. His king now is on the side of the board, his bishop is defending from d8 as opposed to c5. Now we repeated the position. I'm not convinced that I played the correct move. I played bishop e5, stopping bishop c7 to attack my pawn, allowing his bishop back out, knowing I can always go back. What was coming into play at this point in the game was time pressure. We were on the 34th move. We were both nearing time pressure, and in fact, an amazing thing happened at the tournament. There was some kind of minor earthquake right where it was played, and all the lights in the tournament hall went out. It was an amazing moment because we were nearing time pressure, and all the players were looking around. The clocks weren't stopped. And this was a very important competitive moment, because you're playing the World Championship, you're in India, in this incredible playing environment where the lights go out, and you have to keep on trekking. So we repeated, bishop e5, passing the move on to him, trying to get to the 40th move. It will have a new hour. He played bishop e7. Let me just discuss for a moment the psychology of time pressure. This is very, very important. Many players try to avoid making big decisions when they have a few moves left to go before time control. Because in most tournaments, once you reach the 40th move, you get another hour for your next 20 moves, or for the rest of the game. But a lot of the time, avoiding big decisions can be a critical mistake, because you miss your moment and your advantage slips away, or your defense slips away. So sometimes you should not make critical decisions in time pressure if you can maintain control of the position and you're better, and you feel as if you can take critical decisions into a more solid moment. But sometimes, if you're worse, you want the game to reach its crisis when you're in time pressure, because that lack of order can turn things around. And also, even when you're pressing for an advantage, you have to sometimes be brave and make the critical decision on even the 40th move. This has happened in my games quite a few times, when I'm forced to make a big decision on the last move of time control with just seconds on the clock. So now I missed my chance. I should have played bishop c7, bishop c5, and now the tactical move b4. Very, very important. After a takes b4, c takes b4, bishop takes b4, I can play bishop takes b6. I control both of the squares of my a-pawn that his bishop can potentially touch. His king is too far away, and I can push the pawn up the board. b4 would have won the game. But we were nearing time pressure, and I didn't see it in time. Notice that the key to that tactic is his king being far away from the action. I played the move b3. A waiting move. I had to calculate things out, didn't have any time on the clock. And now he played bishop c5, activated his bishop. I lost a moment, I had a good chance, missed it. And here I did another dangerous thing, I played h3. I made 
a very committal move on the king's side in the time scramble. This is dangerous. What I was trying to do was set up a blockade for his king. I knew his king wanted to come up to h5 and g4. I had the idea of playing h3 and g3 to stop his king from going. But this exposed my pawns somewhat to his pushing his pawns here and creating a quick passer. Very dangerous decisions I made. I'm not sure that they were correct. They were made in the time pressure, and this was a competitive moment more than a perfect moment. h3, played king h5, and I played g3, setting up that wall. And now we reach a really tense moment. This is move 37 for him. He has three moves to go, I have two. He played king g6. I played king c4. Now I'm really starting to go, b4. I managed to hold back his pawns. He played bishop e3. This is what endgames are really about. It's very rare that you'll play a perfect endgame. Endgames are about the fight. He started to come on the king's side. I stopped him. I took a risk, just barely stopped him. I missed a chance to go on the queen's side. I could have gotten a pass pawn really quickly. I missed it. Now I've got the initiative again. I have two moves left in time pressure. What should I do? I felt that I had turned things around, so I just repeated once. I played king d3. He went back to c5. I went king c4, he played bishop e3. Sometimes it's good to repeat moves in order to get closer to the time pressure. But don't repeat three times, because then it's a draw. Three-fold repetition. And now I began b4. I broke through on the queen side. He immediately responded to the king side, f4. An endgame of attack and counterattack. Compared to the last bishop endgame against Bengston, where I had a dominant position, and I pushed him back, this game has a very different character. I'm attacking on one side, he's attacking on another side. It's almost like a Sicilian in which I'm attacking his king on one side, he's attacking my king on the other with all the pieces. The endgame can be very exciting. And here's a critical moment. What should white do? We see that his f-pawn is very dangerous. To protect it, I obviously can't take it twice. He wants to play f3, f2, f1, make a queen. I have to decide whether I'm going to play g4 to lock his king out, which is very tempting. Believe me, I wanted to do it. Because if I play g4, his king can never get in. The f5 square and h5 squares are covered. The f6 square is covered by my bishop. There's nothing he can do. If he plays f3, I play king back to d3. But there was a big trap in the position. If I had played g4, he could have made my life tremendously difficult with a tactic. What do you see? <clears throat> Pausing while you think about the current position. Press the play button from the move list to resume. Well, I know what I would like to play, I think. I'm not sure. So let's go ahead and play. What I was nervous about was the move b5 check. This might look bizarre, but remember, the key to my position, if he plays f3, is to play my king back to d3. And then when he ever goes to f2, I play king back to e2. I can defend it with my king. If I had played g4 and he had played b5 check, if king takes b5, then f3, the king can't get back anymore. I would have to play bishop g3. And then we'd have to deal with f2, bishop takes f2, bishop takes f2, and the question as to whether my pawns would go faster than his e-pawn, things would be completely crazy and unclear. If after b5, I were to take with the a-pawn, then he would have a passed a-pawn himself. He'd play a4. And suddenly I have to deal with two things. The a3, a2, a1 threat, the f3, f2, f1 threat. Things suddenly get very, very complicated. I didn't want to allow that to happen. Always watch out for these traps. The end game is full of them. I avoided that. I played b takes a5. He played b takes a5. And now I play g4. Whether or not b5 was good for him isn't really relevant. The point is that it would have been very complicating, and I have an advantage. So there's no reason for me to do that. I played a simple move, stopped his complex idea, and then paralyzed his king. Notice the theme in this end game. I'm keeping his king out of the game. His king is stuck on g6. It's paralyzed there. Active king versus inactive king. We both have passed pawns, not just me. In fact, he has two passed pawns, the f-pawn and the e-pawn. The main difference is the king. 
He pushed, f3. I had to come back and defend, king d3. Attacking his bishop, if he plays f2, I can play king e2 and stop it. He played bishop f4. Offered a trade of bishops. And here I decided to go after his a5 pawn. He played very cleverly. He's a very talented player, as you can feel. His moves have great strength. He's playing very actively and very strongly. So now he's mobilized his kingside pawns. His king still isn't active, although the f6 square will be coming to his control soon. And I have to go on the queen side. I played bishop d4. He played bishop g3, preparing to play f2, and he can still play e5 and e4 soon. I played bishop b6. Now I'm attacking his a5 pawn, and I'm preparing to move with my c pawn. Now he started to go, e5. And here I made a critical decision. I decided that my king could stop his pawns, and I played the move bishop takes a5, preparing an outside pass pawn that would be very hard to stop for him. If he plays f2, I can play king e2, defending the f1 square, and here we see, of course, the weakness of a bishop in the endgame. If he only has a dark square bishop, there's no way to defend the light squares. So usually when you're advancing pawns in bishop endgames, you advance them on the opposite color of your bishop. So that way you can control both the light squares with the pawn, for instance, and the dark squares with the bishop. Or the light squares with the bishop and the dark squares with the pawn. Keep that in mind. If he plays f2, then I can blockade. If he pushes his pawns on light squares, then he can control everything. After bishop takes a5, he played e4 check. His point is obviously that if king takes e4, he wins immediately with f2. My idea was king e3. Once again, we see that the main difference in this position is that I'm playing with my king and his king is doing nothing. An active king in the endgame is critical. So again, if he plays f2, I go back and defend. If he plays bishop f4 check, then I go back again. And what we see is that my king can control his pawns, because if the e-pawn ever goes up check, then I can take the f-pawn with a blockade. The only hope would be for him to check me on the long diagonal. So if he tries bishop d6, threatening bishop c5 check, if he gets that check in, I could be in trouble. But now I could play bishop b6 and stop it. I control the diagonal, and then my a-pawn will fly. Precise calculation was necessary. Here he realized that the bishop and pawns couldn't do the work alone, so he tried to bring in his king, king f6. But I wouldn't let him. Bishop d8 check. I forced him right back. If he had played king e6, then I would have simply taken the pawn. Bishop takes g5, and now I would have had four pawns to do with an a-pawn and an h-pawn passed, both of which are very hard to handle, not to mention the c and g-pawns. This would be winning. After bishop d8 check, he had to go back to the defense, king g6. And now I set up my optimum position. I played bishop b6. He played king f6, I played a5, and now he tried a trick, he played bishop h2. Because if I play a6, then he could play bishop g1 check, followed by bishop takes, a skewer. Of course, I wasn't going to fall for that. The difference now is that he doesn't control the f2 square with his bishop, so I can take the pawn. I just played king takes e4, the f3 pawn is gone, and he resigned, and I win. So the key to this endgame was my king. Remember this, in bishop endgames, knight endgames, rook endgames, an active king is essential. Here he was locked out of the play, and in a very fierce double-edged game, what gave me the advantage was the fact that I was playing with one large weapon that he was playing without, my king. In the middle game, you should defend him, protect him. In the end game, use him actively. Okay. <clears throat> I think I'm going to... Um, I'm going to pause this and let's and take a look at how many minutes... All right, it's been 33 minutes, give or take. So, we're going to call this video Endgame Course Part 2, Bishops of Same Color, Part 1. <laughs> um, we'll get into the Teodoro versus Waitzkin on the next video. Keep on playing. I hope these videos are helping you learn to play chess. Um, I know they're helping me. Until next time.